Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to talk about Jet Strike. Cool. Wow. I don't know why we did the Mario you know, it's, it's a Kung Fu game. It's a Jet Li. <laughs> so, uh, but before we get into what we think about Jet Strike, um, Aaron, what's been going on here in the wider Amigos community this week in terms of what's been on our site on everythingamiga.com? Well, we've had a, a single submission this week from our good and dear friend, the man, the myth, the legend. The D- Dream Catcher. I almost called him the Deem Catcher. I don't know why. And Dream Catcher, you know, again, he's still on his Bond kick. And this one, that's when I, believe it or not, I actually had played back in the day, uh, the Stealth Affair. Uh, now, this is an interesting one because it basically was a, got reskinned, effectively. It, lo- it looks like Bond. Max Headroom on the well, front. Well, if you'll scroll down, that's Operation Stealth, and that's the James Bond, the Stealth Affair. Pretty much the same game. Okay. Uh, and, uh, it's a decent little game. It was it was very well received. I remember it back in the day, and of course, uh, this is Dreamcatcher going going into work on this thing. So he it pretty fleshes it out quite nicely. I'm a big Bond guy, as I've mentioned many times. Uh, this game this was a uh, uh, sort of an independent work. Uh, there, it's not really based on a on a film. Sort of like the fate of Atlantis in Indiana Jones. That's right. That's right. And so they you know you have that bit of uh, of uh, leeway. And uh, you know, I you know, honestly, I don't remember a ton about it. It's okay. Uh, it's 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 not bad. I'm trying to remember which version I played. I think I played the non-Bond version of this one. Uh, but uh, 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 Dreamcatcher digs in there, his usual stuff. And so, if you're into Bond, I would suggest giving that a, a good solid read. About awesome, it. awesome, cool. How about our YouTube channel? Anything new on there? We did well. I guess we should just take it from the top here. So. Right away, uh, we, me, and you had to go uh, at our uh, uh, at, on our live stream. We went ahead and, and played ourselves a little bit of our, our Sex Spectrum game this week. I, I, I did not. I did not put that on the channel. You did not put that on no, the channel. No, why? Yeah. Why? Why? It was it? <laughs> well, first of all, we had a go. We didn't necessarily yeah. have a good go. Your, your, your streaming computer in Amigo Studios East has the power of the ZX Spectrum. Well, so there were there were several uh, what incidents. I, what I have found that. out was that that computer was updating as we were trying uh, to play this game. Okay. And since Windows decides that you can no longer do anything without its express written consent. <laughs> It just went ahead and just updated right <laughs> along, which it, it jacked up. It did. It, it jacked up my other show, too. So it didn't do us any favors. Um, Speaking of the other show. If you're into the other show, uh, me and the Brent, this was Brent's idea this week. I had no idea he was going to come up with this wacky concept. But the wacky concept was black and white games. Uh, and we looked at uh, what are you, the game that you introduced me to back in the day, Bo Glider, mm-hmm. for the... Uh, I guess the classic Max. Right. And then, of course, me being the outside-the-box thinker that I am, I went for a pinball machine. Uh, and the pinball machine is a game called Centaur, which is a very unique-looking machine that it's all black and white. The only color, color in it is the lights and some yeah. little dash. I will red. say this is probably the least attractive pinball machine I've ever seen in my life. This is a very polarizing machine uh, because some people don't like the art style. It's actually, I think it's, it's a creepy machine. It's really, when you play this game... There's a the the sound synthesis on it has a reverb board, mm. so when it when it speaks, it's real uh, echoey and c- creepy sound, mm-hmm. and, and it goes quite nicely with the whole the p- the full art package that the game has. So it's a mixed bag. It also was I think it was the first game to offer five ball multi balls. Really, uh, and since it's such a flat machine without any uh, ramps or anything, it's it gets crazy with the multi It's a difficult machine, but. When, we, when Brent picked black and white games, I thought, hey, when am I going to get to talk about this again? So I went ahead and threw it in. It's it's an interesting game, and one of the few, one game that we actually pinball wise, you could actually go play on the pinball arcade if you wanted to. So, so that was our effort this week. Um, oh boy, I didn't even see that. That's Bo. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So uh, I put up. This is we are coming to the end of our uh, Amiga Ireland coverage. This is one that uh, I put up uh, last week. This is uh, Clear Course from Greece uh, gave a talk on uh, 3D ray tracing on the Amiga, uh, something that I just do constantly. 
<laughs> um, and so he goes through all the ins and outs using Lightwave 3D, and uh, it's very informative. Uh, so if you are into that sort of scene, um, you know, the, the audio quality is it's listenable, but it's not spectacular. I apologize for that, but we were sort of on a fly-by-wire uh, kind of deal with the, with the live streaming. But, uh, you know, if, if you're into uh, doing ray tracing or finding out more about it, definitely check this out. Have you ever done any ray tracing in your life? Never in my life. I have, and mm -hmm. it was on the Amiga. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the only time I've ever done what did it. You, what did you trace? I don't remember. I don't remember what I was... It just screwed around, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, and me and my buddy, Larry, who was a big... Larry was into that stuff. He, he, loved, he loved fractals. He loved ray tracing. There's a program on the Amiga, and someone will refresh my memory on it, where you can generate entire landscapes. Really awesome. I used to play with that a lot. There's another one uh, where you could where you could look at all the different stars at different points in history, you know, stuff like that non-game related stuff. The Amiga had a lot of really unusual bits of software, but ray tracing was something that was kind of fun. You just set set up your thing and leave for a while. And right, I was going to say, no matter what you're doing with stuff like Distant that. Distant Suns, thank you, Will, uh, and Vista Pro. That both those are the exact ones I was talking about. Distant Suns is a very unique piece of software. Uh, I always thought it was cool just because you could see the different star, wh what the stars are like on mm -hmm. certain days and certain times and certain areas. And then Vista Pro where you could generate these landscapes. They were very, at the time, they were incredibly realistic looking landscapes. I had a lot of fun with them. It seems like no matter what you're doing with ray tracing or rendering, it always takes time. It always takes oh, time. Yeah. You're always leaving your computer on overnight and coming back in the morning. Absolutely. And a lot happens. of that stuff. Another, another thing we used to play with those morphing programs that sort of Fell out of favor, but morphing was sort of a went through a thing. You know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. And those mm -hmm. are a lot of fun to you set the different points and have your face. Yeah, morph and L stuff. LGR just did a big video on that. Oh yeah, so. yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the last bit of us. Uh, uh, site news uh, I played some chaos the Battle of Wizards oh, this, which uh, I watched this was this was an epic stream yeah right? this yeah was a, much more smoothly that's went than ours uh, we I played a full eight player match uh, it was it, it was it was spectacular I was on the cusp of victory don't, don't give away the ending because it's a, this a, you go watch the ending of this this is <laughs> this is grand fashion ending oh, this is a great one I enjoyed I watched the beginning and the end of this and I felt pretty good about it yeah <laughs> so uh, um, that is everything that's going on on the site and on the YouTube channel this week, Aaron. But now it's time to summon the gamble train. It's pulling into the station. This week's bevy of Amiga News, Aaron. There were stories. This is the first time that I've ever had to do this. And I've been doing the news for a long, long time on this show. And... Um, this is the first time that I've had to cut stories because we had too many stories. So much stuff. So I, you're I, like Concrete. You're Concrete. <laughs> you're like Walter Concrete. <laughs> it's his brother. That's right. Some, somehow. <laughs> um, so, but we're going to start things off, Aaron, with a new Amiga Future magazine. Okay, so this is Amiga Future 137. They've been at this game a long yeah. time. Um, there is tons of tons of new content, as we know. You know, Amiga Future ha is one of the top uh, print Amiga magazines out there, and they're covering a game that we just covered a couple weeks ago, Power Glove Reloaded, as well as uh, another new title, Trap Runner, that just came out a couple weeks ago. There's always great reports on uh, you know all the various things that are going on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Amiga Future 137 on available on newsstands right now. It's funny. I was uh, ironic. I was just looking through Amiga Future, the December issue, uh, which of course we we gifted. But it is a tremendous read. I mean, I, I, it's uh, it's really well done. And it, uh, whatever translations they have to go through to get that thing, because I guess they have several different print colors. They do a good job. Yeah. It's sounding really good. Now this one, Aaron, we're going to both have to try this out. This is Mod Surfer. Okay, Mod Surfer is a game that was just released. This is a rhythm game um, where I, I, I know you've played this kind of game before. I think we played it on Amigathon where yeah, you've got a ball great. and you're moving back and forth. Well, this one kind of works the opposite way. You're following a mod file tracker. You can import any mod file that you want and um, and you will play a lot. You're you're actually playing along rhythm game style with the mod. You know, with the ball. Wow, any mod can yeah. go on this. Oh yeah. man! I so it, that a shot. it says um, larger mods will need a more chip RAM, but as yeah. long as you've got the the jack, you can you can do any mod. So isn't I got that, the isn't, jack, brother? Isn't that a cool idea? That is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was that music game we put on the Amigathon? It was sort of like rock, a rock band. You remember that? 
it, you know, you remember I remember it. it. I remember it. Was it. Really I can't fun. think of what, I can't yeah. think of the name of it either. It was really good. But yeah, that looks great. But being able to plug in your own music, outstanding. I love it. Uh, there's another new release this week. This is uh, from the same people that brought us Trap Runner. This comes to us from our buddy uh, Neil over at Indie Retro News. Uh, Celtic Heart. Uh, this is another platformer game, uh, much like Trap Runner, except it's set in a new environment. You've got a, sort of a medieval environment, and you're playing as a knight, uh, and you are traversing various environments. Uh, so if you are a fan of Trap Runner and you want uh, another great platformer for your Amiga, check out Celtic Hearts. That looks pretty good, doesn't yeah. it? Now, you know, now Trap... Oh. I thought Trap Runner was one of those endless running games. Oh that, no! But it, it, so it's just sort of like it's like a platforming type. Right. Thing. Okay. Right. Cool. That's um, good. This is a new podcast well, that I just found out about. A new Amiga podcast. Uh, well, the, Hold they the phone. they are not doing exclusively Amiga. This is an arcade attack retro gaming podcast. Okay. okay? But this month they are focusing in on the Amiga and what makes it special. So if you are looking for a uh, an, another podcast to try out, try these guys out. I listened to a little bit of it. They've got good audio. It's good quality content. Uh, so check these guys out, the Arcade Attack Retro Gaming Podcast. Very cool. cool. Yeah. Um, there is a new edition of Personal Paint for the Amiga. Um, do you know anything about Personal Paint? I know of it. I don't think I've ever used it. Okay, well, Personal Paint, I believe, is the only paint program that's still being updated for both the classic Amiga and the more modern Amigas. Hmm. So you can get this for both 3031 or if you have a newer Amiga 39. Okay, um, Personal Paint, I honestly don't know anything about, but I know that lots of people use it. And uh, you can get some really good results with it. There are some. Uh, That's the classic. I've seen that picture many yeah, times. Yeah, Old ham. Yeah. So, um, if you are interested in personal paint, there's a new version out. It is for sale. You can buy it. Looks like customers outside the EU and UK. It's for sale for 16 Great British pounds. So, not bad. 20 yeah. spot. Yeah, not bad. Now, given our history of art. Uh, from the various Amigathons, we should never be uh, getting this. <laughs> yeah, We're, there's no, no paint program that can make us artists. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, now, Aaron, we had quite a loss in the world of music last week. Uh, the prodigy frontman uh, Keith Flint passed away sadly, um, and uh, sort of in his honor, I saw this posted. Uh, a guy named Aaron White has posted a folder full of Prodigy mods uh, here. And so I've linked to his mega um, his mega download site. And you can, um, you can go on there and you can download all, I guess there are probably six or seven different Prodigy songs. Were you a Prodigy fan? I hated Prodigy. <laughs> but that much said, of course, that's a sad thing that yeah. happened. Yeah. Obviously, he was a... He had some problems. I've never really considered you a fire starter. Yeah, I, that song yeah. is one of my all-time hate, most hated songs. You're more of a wet blanket. Now, have I heard their entire discography? No, I have not. So they may have some great stuff, but I did. I, that song it fills me with a certain sense of dread. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. But well, let's still, move that's on. Cool. That's still cool. Let's move on to happier news. Our buddy Pixels at Dawn has compiled his memories from Amiga Ireland all into a vlog where he's talking and showing different pictures of things that went down at Amiga Ireland. It's quite entertaining. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, I watched it and then I made my wife watch it. <laughs> wow, so, what a ringing endorsement for me. Yeah, the, uh, the, the best part of it all is that he goes in depth into my fantastic uh, win at Worms uh, when I played against him and Paul Harrington. So I was very glad to relive the glory. When you know, I noticed something he mentioned in here. I can't remember exactly what he said. He goes, he said something this and then and boat when he would when he would bother to show up or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, that's because I was a full day late getting there. Okay, that yeah. would explain it then. Yeah. yeah. Um what so, happened there? Is it just why were you a day late? Well, I, I'm limited with the amount of time I can take off work. No, oh, no, so. so this wasn't you weren't actually late. You were no. scheduled to get there well, later. Well, I, I also my bus was later than I when oh, I expected so. to. I was late on multiple well, there's levels. nothing you could do about no, it. No, no. I thought you were just sleeping in the hotel room oh. or something. <laughs> no, that's my normal move, but oh, not yeah. in this case. That's <laughs> That's the boat movie. <laughs> yeah. Sleep, entire vacation spent at sleep in hotel. Got it. Now, this one comes from one of the biggest names in the Amiga scene these days, our buddy Retro Man Cave. Um, he has availed himself of the task 
of saving these Amigas for the Museum of Computing. I believe he's talking about the Museum of Computing over in Leicester, which is home to uh, various Amigos. Um, and he goes... <laughs> Amigas. <laughs> <laughs> no, home to various amigos. Oh, we're I'm talking about I'm talking about Chris Foles oh, and Darren Cole. I thought you meant the museum and no. the amigos stuck in it. No. Well, I guess it's it was probably home to various amigos as well. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Retro Man Cave goes through uh, his what what he's most known for. He's he's done this whole series of, you know, can we restore this machine? They're very well shot. He's a he's a very entertaining guy. Also proud Patreon supporter of this fine show. You know, the thing about Neil, I, did you watch all this? Have I you, have not watched it all yet. I just I watched, watched the beginning. I watched it all. First thing, every time I watch Neil do one of these, he's got these uh, cat burglar gloves he puts on. Mm -hmm. And it always looks like, I keep waiting for him to just pick everything up and just run <laughs> just out the run door. Out, yeah. All he needs is one of those hamburger masks. <laughs> and he, he's ready to go. You know, like a turtleneck, some yeah. tight black pants. It is strange. <laughs> I haven't seen people don the black gloves and to, I, to work I, on stuff. And I was watching him do this. Like, he's got three or four of these things. They each got problems. And one on the keyboard didn't work. So, And I was thinking to myself, this is why I don't do these videos. Because what I would have done is just frank Einstein one, and there was one. He's like, "This uh, this isn't the right model light for this." Mm. I would have. He's like, "And this is for a museum. We've got to keep this pure." It wouldn't. That never crossed my mind. Yeah. Until he I was like, "Oh yeah, museum." Right. Because me, I'm just a big hacking machine. But mm -hmm. Neil, he does a proper job. Yeah. So, but uh, I enjoyed this quite a bit. And just yeah. a quick correction from the chat: the uh, the museum he's referring to is actually in Swindon, okay. not in Leicester. So. Boat. How could you make such I know. a silly mistake? I, know. I don't know. Um. And finally, Aaron, the final story of the week. This is this is one that I know you're itching to talk about. Jens Schoenfield may shut down individual computers and leave the Amiga scene. So why don't you, I know that you, you've researched this far and wide. Why don't you give us a recap of this story? Well, you know how I feel about this, but I'll just give it a quick... I don't know how you I, feel about it. Yeah. Basically, long story short is uh, this fellow... Uh, feels like he's getting uh, muscled out of the market effectively by Cloanto. Um, there's a, you know, this whole legal situation between uh, Iperion and Cloanto and to a certain degree Acer, I guess, who are the big masters of it all. It uh, it goes back and forth. We Like I said, we mentioned a couple uh, shows ago where uh, Cloanto had picked up those a couple trademarks and, a, you know, and still got a court ruling. Uh, the there's a. I've never seen this groundswell of of uh, disdain for Cloanto until this has gotten really pretty bad uh, this week. I've seen a lot of people on the on the forums, on Facebook, on various groups that are very angry at Cloanto. Uh, now, um, Cloanto has always been nice to us, uh, but we and and without knowing, I'm slowly getting all the particulars in this instance. And I told. The guys in this court, I'm like, you know, this whole situation. I was like, I'm glad you have to sit down and play games. I don't even care much about this, but I, th I suppose we'll throw our two cents worth in on it. And we'll, and it, here it is: um, if Cloanto is fighting for their business model, which is effectively what they are, are they fighting cleanly? You know, or are they fighting fairly? Are they fighting in the interests of the hobbyists? Probably not. Because the interest of the hobbyists, unfortunately, does not pay the bills, mm -hmm. and you are and you are fighting over very lean pickings here. Um, if everything I've read is true and Cloanto is looking after themselves, uh, then that's what you would do as a business. It's not good or right or even fair, but that's the way it goes. Uh, and since I'm not endorsing what the, what Cloanto does with legal wranglings, but there's a reason they would do that. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if a fellow like this guy feels necessary to leave this market because uh, he is going to be sued into oblivion or the money is not to be there to be made, uh, it makes common, perfectly good sense that he would leave the, uh, that he would leave the market. It just, it sucks. That sucks, but it is what it is. Uh, I think people often, and this happens in not just Amiga, but in a lot of areas, people get fandom and hobbyist business mixed up with actual business. And the fact of it is, if you're a business, you're there to make money, and you are there to make money uh, as best you can. And if they have to do things that seem unsightly to the uh, community, uh, and they're clearly willing to do those, then that's what they're going to do. Now, with that said, uh, the community's response can be in the form of your wallet or pocketbook, purse, 
Uh, and if you decide that the uh, acts perpetrated by Cloanto are so heinous that you can't support them anymore, uh, probably the best way to get through to them, your disdain or, or disfavor with them, is to not give them any more money. Mm -hmm. And so that ends that. Really, the discussion on the matter is redundant. It's been going on for years, you know? This side, that side, irrelevant. If you don't like the way things are going, do not pay people money. That's the bottom of the truth. Uh, and you always get on me for talking about this subject, and finally I've come around to your line of thinking, where I'm so sick of it that I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> so that pretty much that's my two cents. You care well, to throw I, in? I think you, you phrased that very well. I'm surprised at how articulate you were. I'm just kidding. You're always articulate. Um, but uh, but I, I agree with everything you said. You know, I, I hope that um, people you know do keep this sort of thing in mind when they decide if they want to support Cloanto in the future. You know, is this the kind of is this the kind of company that you want to give money to? No matter if they come out with a five dollar vampire Amiga next week, you know, do you want to give them that money even if it's something that you really want that you think is really cool? Um, you know, that'll be the real test. Right now, Cloanto with Amiga Forever, I'm sure that they, they get a lot of business through that, but I think they may be trying to play the long game with one of these mini Amigas in the future. And the real proof in the pudding on how mad the fans are is if they choose to support this thing or not. I saw a fellow who had said he was not going to go to a con that, that uh, Cloanto was at. He was not going to buy Amiga Forever. So he, they suggest you take back the one you already bought and get your money back. They also mentioned that the uh, that Cloanto gets money for every uh, a mini Commodore that's sold, mm -hmm. which they would. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, what does that mean? We've often talked about a mini Amiga, and there's going to be one coming because there's money to be made. Now, everyone will want one, including me. If you have a problem with the way things are going. I suggest you don't buy one. Right. You know, if uh, you'll have to weigh your feelings on the subject, and I'm not, uh, I'm not fully, uh, I'm not fully damning Cloanto in this either. I've heard both sides have an issue with this, and I honestly just don't have the inclination to dig deep into the court records on this. I got bigger fish to fry. Mm -hmm. you know, we got to talk about Jet Strike in five minutes. That's I right. Mean, we got we got real news. You know, we play games mm -hmm. and 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 we love it. That's what we do. And the good thing is, your old Amiga almost will play almost every game without having to screw with it. You don't have to do anything. It's still unfair for the people that like to enjoy the upgrades and all that stuff. But luckily for us, we just don't have to care that much. Right. So, and so there you go. Yeah. And with that, we're going to end uh, this week's news segment. Um, just to remind you all, uh, all of our links that we talk about on the show are posted over at gather.com, and that's gather spelled with two Gs. If you search for the Amigos podcast tag, uh, you can follow every every story that's tagged with that. Um, and we, uh, I want to thank everybody that's that's following that tag now. Um, I think it's a, a really a really great way to organize what we talk about on the show every week. Mm. All right, so Aaron. It's time to move on to this week's game, Jet Strike. Whoa! Jet Strike. Mm -hmm. So, again, I've never played this game. Bo, have you played this before this week? Never. Never heard of this game either. So, there you go. I'm hoping to get to it next week. <laughs> ba -doom boom <laughs> So, uh, this game was released in the heady, heady year of 1994. They were circling the drain in 94, boat, and here comes Jet Strike. Now, uh, be forewarned, there are multiple versions of this game. You've got your Amiga 500 version. I believe it was only a couple discs on the 500, and there were five discs on the AGA version. When I say 500, I say a ECS. Mm -hmm. And then there's a CD32 version. Um, this game it was put out, it was published. I love this, guys. They were published by an outfit called Rasputin. Otherwise known as the Mad Monk boat, uh, I don't think Rasputin ever did. They did very I, little. I, I don't think Rasputin was heavily involved in Amiga well, development. Well, they they published a couple of the of the uh, developers stuff. I was uh, talking about the Mad Monk. Oh, I see. Yeah, the uh, the uh, developers this for an outfit named Shadow Shadow Software. Now, uh, what do you know about Shadow Software boat? I don't know. It sounds like something you'd be behind. Yeah, it's a cool name. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, Shadow Software is actually a couple guys. They're brothers, in fact. Adam and Aaron Fothergill. Okay. Fothergill. It's a brother team. 
So what's the scoop on these guys? I dug into it because I thought that was interesting. By the way, FYI, they had did several. They did several games on the Amiga. I've not heard or played any of these. Uh, they did a game called Base Jumpers, which I've heard got pretty good. Uh, Deadline. They also did a, a game called Jetstream Junior or Jet Strike Junior, and Magic Forest One and Two. I've not heard of a single one of those no. games. So, so I that I figured I better have a look at who the heck these guys were. So as I mentioned, this is a brother team. I found a couple interviews that kind of shed some light on what the scoop was with these guys. So um, a lot of people uh, think this game looks a lot like that, was it Wings of Fury game we reviewed? Mm -hmm. I think me and Brent did a review of that uh, for the uh, X68000 right. back in the day. And uh, they they mentioned that this was not, this this they didn't even see that game until after they were halfway through with this one. Uh, this is actually a follow-up to an Atari ST game called Sky Strike that they'd done, uh, which of course I'd not heard of that one either. Uh, and they uh, they they said Wings of Fury had nothing to do with that. So if there's the only really similarities are the are sort. I mean there are some, but it, the, the games don't play the same. Have you ever played Wings of Fury? No. Yeah, they don't play the same at at, at, at all. So <coughs> um, these guys were both crazy airplane guys back in the day and they were both game guys and their their dad was in the RAF okay so they were really crazy about planes they traveled a lot and stuff and so they decided they were going to sit down and write like the base of the ultimate game that had planes in it and there are a ton of planes in this uh, if you there the two different versions have two different sets of planes you can play uh, you can play 40 planes on the ECS version and 60, 60 on the AGA and, and C32 version, including, but not limited to, you, uh, on the on the uh, on the uh, AGA version at least, you can be a dragon, <laughs> and you can also, and I'll, I did this. <laughs> this is one of the planes I tried, hang glider, which I found highly amusing. Uh, there's even a way that you can uh, play as a UFO. Uh, it, it's a very rare Easter egg that's mm. in this thing. So let's talk about what the game is before we move along. So this is an air combat game. It's a side view game. Uh, and you stop me when you think of a better way to phrase it than that. And you pick a, a number of, from a huge number of airplanes and you fly missions. All right, That's the main of the game. Uh, there's a ton of airplanes, and I mean a ton. There are MiGs. There are uh, experimental craft. There are uh, Fokers. There are hang gliders. Helicopters. There are helicopters. Several different types of helicopters. Mm -hmm. uh, to go along with this, uh, there's also like uh, like 40 or 50 armaments, and these armaments are all real life. There are 60 weapons, including but not limited to tactical nukes. So. If which I didn't run any missions where I, I got these tactical yeah. nukes. Um, it seems the, like the, the play field is so small that any deployment of a tactical nuke <laughs> would, would not, not be good. Be good. Yeah. Um, now, the box says there's 200 missions. Mm -hmm. I know there are at least 150 missions, so yeah. I can't I can get Maybe from, counting the training missions, too. Po possibly so. The uh, box also says it has 24-bit AGA graphics. Pretty cool. Um, the, uh, the game centers around your attempts to thwart the evil organization known as SPUD, the Society of Particularly Undesirable Dastardly Dudes. Mm. Good name. And so once you pick your plane, uh, you will be uh, entered into a mission. The missions range from photography to uh, taking out uh, incoming aircraft. There are... Uh, Missions different day, day Bombing and night. Missions. There's fog. Mm -hmm. There's uh, there's picking up people. There's dropping off yep. people. There's there's uh, all kinds of crazy missions. Um, you uh, since you fly in this sideways view, uh, I'm trying to think what what you could really equate this game to. I mean, like I said, it does remind me of Wings of Fury to a certain degree. The view of it. But some of it reminds me a little bit of like a, of a choplifter. Right. There's an element where you're of a rescue mm -hmm. in some of the missions. I think choplifter is that was the game that I, always, I was comparing it to in my mind. Um, there's all I mean, especially when you're playing a helicopter, it's a little more like choplifter. Um, uh, when you complete your mission, you can complete a mission and die, which mm -hmm. thank God for that because I'd never have gotten anywhere if it wasn't for that. Because at some point you had to try to land these suckers, and then once you complete the mission, you move on. 
to the to the next mission. Now, uh, having played, I tried this. I tried the. Uh, I tried all three versions of this, believe it or not, just to see what would happen. The uh, uh, the issue, the major differences I found were like, for example, you know, the screen is a loading screen right before you actually play. It's got these two old guys over a control panel. It doesn't look as good on the ECS version. The guys look bizarre. Their mm. eyes look really weird. Uh, and you know, of course, it, the graphics are, are spiced better. The colors are spiced better on the on the uh, on the on the bigger version. I also tried playing this on the GoTech, and uh, that's a pain with that many discs. I will say that was I didn't last too long playing the AGA version of this. The for once, the CD32 version has something that is almost mandatory in this series, which is the wackiest soundtrack of all time. Did you listen to the soundtrack? You know, I played this game a bunch and maybe I was only, is the AGA version different than the CD32 version? The CD32 version? version has CD digital sound. Okay, I don't recall okay. that. Okay, so it's got two hits. <laughs> these two hits are gold. And they wrote these and sang them, the brothers. One is called uh, Drop the Bomb. <laughs> All I could say is you need to hear this song, Drop the Bomb. <laughs> the other one was Fast Jet Fever, which is, I mean, it's a complete ripoff of Danger Fever. Zone. It's oh. the, but it, and the funny thing about it is the lyrics are so dopey, and they knew that when they made it. That was, that's, that's part of the charm. Mm -hmm. These, these, these songs alone, plus the few others have, are enough for me to recommend the game. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> They're so unbelievably dopey and mm -hmm. oaky. Plus the fact that these guys sang their own tunes. That's amazing. I which love I, that. I, I, lo I love that. A um, little trivia about the game. Uh, there are a zillion uh, planes in it, right? These guys basically hand drew each frame for each plane wow. in the game. So every game, every plane in this, they hand drew all the different movements. It's like a ton of them. I saw a picture that had them all outlined. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. So this was no... Uh, this was no quickie. This took them forever to do, and they, but they, you know, and they did a good job. So let's talk about the actual game itself in terms of how it plays. Well, <clears throat> I, oh, how did you think it played? Um, I thought this game played great. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, I have a feeling going from your comments and the comments on the Discord that I'm going against the grain here, but the people that are that can't play this game have not read the manual. That is my feeling well, because I read I'm the gonna, manual. I'm going to challenge that theory. And I was immediately able to do everything that I needed to do. Okay. Now, the what the hang-ups came from my brain not adjusting to the directional controls on the plane, the the height controls because the the biggest problem with this game. Okay, first of all, let me let me explain what the controls are. So, you press right to take off which is weird because that's like the opposite of the direction that you're going in, but that's okay. So then when you're facing left, down points your nose up and up points your nose down, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if you go, if you press down, you'll eventually get to the point where you're facing straight up and then your plane will turn and you'll go the other way. Uh, I believe that Choplifter is the same sort of deal. Now, the, the, the hang-up occurs is now, now that you're facing right and you're traveling in the opposite direction, your height controls are reversed. So now, down moves you down and up points your nose up. That is the biggest fault of this game. Is, and it's not really the game's fault, it's my own fault for not being able to like encapsulate that within my brain. Too dumb. Right, I'm too dumb. Um, lots of people think landing is difficult in this game. Landing is not difficult in this game. If you read the directions, you can see that if you approach the runway and you hold down the button, the plane will land itself 100% perfectly every time. Well, see, my problem wasn't the landing, per se, on the runway. It was the violent, painful landing when I careened into the earth. Again, yeah. you know, you can approach the runway from any height, from any distance, and if you hold down the button, the plane will land itself. So most of the people's problems with this game, I am convinced, is that if you're having trouble with landing, it's because you didn't read that in the directions. I had trouble with landing, and I had the book. Well, you, yeah, I have my, many my books that I haven't controls were totally read. different. I'm, I changed the control. And that was probably also part of your problem. Well, I mean, you, it's in the options. You sure. can go in there and change the control. So I turned on the, uh, uh, of course, I have the CD32 pad, which I turned that on. And I also played the, I played this on the Amiga and on my uh, PC. I've, the company's version, this works. It's one of the ones they've got the new versions out. 
By the way, I strongly recommend if you've got a PC that uh, the company has really uh, excelled themselves with their new, uh, you know, EXE. Self-extracting EXEs. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. And they've cha they've fixed a lot of stuff we didn't like about mm -hmm. them before. The saving configurations yeah, and stuff, they're a that lot too. better. I mean, those guys are really, they're, they came through, especially from an outfit that was probably going to be gone. Um, the controls in this are, but at first, I was absolutely befuddled on this. And the first thing I did was try, I fired this up on... Uh, uh, Amiga Forever, ironically, it didn't work right. So I don't, you can't play the AGA version on there unless you tweak it. And I didn't bother, so I've got a machine there, but I tried it on there. Um, the controls on this, I, the way I did it was I used the numbers, the numbers one to ten for my speed thrust or whatever. Is that what you did? That's no. what I, okay. I, I used those. I used the keyboard and the stick in conjunction with each other, uh, and, uh, and that was my easiest way to go. Mm -hmm. um, the, the so game. you had the you had the stick on the table in front of you, well, and then you got I, the I, other I had hand a pad. on the. I had a pad in front of me with it, yeah, uh, and I would just flip down and slow down. That or whatever. seems like a nightmare. Well, I mean that's just one of the control uh, control options. Um, the uh, the some of this parts of this game I think are interesting. The uh, the uh, the varied missions are cool, and we'll get to the uh, the Air Olympics thing here in a minute. But the uh, just the combat missions themselves, there, there's a lot of options in there in terms of what they throw at you, and you can tell they put a lot of thought into it. Uh, and this is one of those games that I strongly would suspect that you would get better at if you played it a lot. I played it some, I played it as much as I could, uh, but. I was never what I would call great. I, I, I could get, how, how many missions in did you go before you? Oh, I don't know, I did quite a few. I did probably, I think I could get to like the eighth or so. Once you hit the fifth mission, I believe it is, the the, the difficulty ramps way up, uh, way, way up. Something else is when you, like for example, if you're coming in and you've got bogeys or targets coming in at you, they come in fast. Mm -hmm. They come in from different angles. Yeah. A target will appear on the screen to allow you to know where they're coming from. But it's they're tough. I will say that that is the part of the game that was the most that felt the most unfair to me is the speed at which the, your the other the other targets come in at you. This is one game where I will agree with Boat in this rare instance. You've got to, at the bare minimum pick you up a, some sort of keyboard control booklet or something because for starters I would I would try this game out. I mean, you know, normally what do I do? Dirty rotten stinking filthy pirate. Get the game, throw it in, play it. No docs. Screw docs. You get in a plane, and you go up, and you can't shoot. You can't do anything. You're just like an idiot. Well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta pull your landing gear up. All right. Mm -hmm. What well, that seems obvious, but if you don't think about right. it, you know you're boned. Right. right, and it's not L like you might think. It's right. you. It's for undercarriage. Uh, you, uh, the uh, um, and then once you do that, you have to uh, you have to anticipate bogeys in this game because your plane can get damaged and destroyed like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and even the brothers mentioned that this game was not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. They mentioned that they put a they put an easy glide through mission, a couple like learn to do it missions, and then the rest of it's like we hate you mm -hmm. style missions. They right. you know so it's difficult, and for a game that's got an arcadey sort of feel for it, this is something that falls between an arcade fl flying game and a simulation. I mean, it really. You know is. what other game that this reminded me of is that biplane duel game. Do you remember playing that in Amiga? I do. I do. Um, I found this easier to control than that, um, but I, it's it's a similar kind of side view plane thing. Um, but I like the variants. Like I said, there's a lot to like here. Uh, the when you start the game, you have a, uh, all these planes at your disposal, and then the gimmick is as you go through the game, you have limited numbers of most of these, mm -hmm. and so you can eventually, if certain planes are uh, more uh, efficient at certain missions then you would pick that plane and then the gimmick is eventually you'd run out of that plane so you better hope that there are no missions coming up where this plane would be the one that you'd want to take you know sometimes you need a quick fighter sometimes you need something larger mm -hmm. with more armaments you right know? sometimes you need something you know sometimes you need a helicopter or whatnot um i did say i played the helicopter a lot that one i found easiest to control and it was certainly easy to land uh and uh, it worked well on some missions, uh, so that was the one I chose the most. The game also moves fast, like Boat mentioned when we were talking about the tactical nukes. There's not a, the playfield seems immense, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And when, especially in a very quick jet, 
you can get across the there's a this is almost like a defender play field. There's like you've got sort of the same kind of radar screen you do in Defender at the bottom, and it sort of shows you uh, where you're at, and 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 and, and you know it as the and the world doesn't wrap. I mean, you basically get the end. You can, you know it. So well, it does. It, it the world does wrap. The the world doesn't. My point is when you when you go off the side, you don't want to. You're all the way back to the beginning. It's weird. It's weird for me to come to grips with that in a game like this. It doesn't make any sense. The world wraps around like Defender style. Yeah. But that's weird. It's just not Defender. Why is it weird in this and not in Defender? I don't know. Well, Defender's old. <laughs> I guess that's one reason. I would expect This, this game is also it's old. It's not that old. It doesn't make any sense because the enemy technically is right near you, I guess is what I'm saying, if, if you go out the other way. It's confusing. The whole that was one of the things that got I thought was weird. Another thing that's weird is the way, and for guys that roll in airplanes, these airplanes don't turn or move like a real airplane, <laughs> right? I mean, well, the, you, you can take off like this. You punch the gas, just go, boop, right? And you can do turns. Psh, yeah, yeah. And so when you're, you didn't find that odd the way the where the where the you would warp basically. Well, I, it's a video game. But I mean, you, it is odd. It's a video game. I guess you've got to you, you've got to you've got to make concessions for what you want to do. You know, one of the things that I appreciated about this game is they didn't give you this vast expanse. Like, remember Z Wolf? Like yeah. how the, they gave you basically the the whole world to fly around, and you'd spend large amounts of times just trying to figure out where you were supposed to go. This game, you could tell immediately where your target was from that from that from the radar. You could go in and try and do it, and if you mess up, then you're back in the action. I like Z Wolf's approach better, to be honest with you. Uh, this game, it it was hard for me. It was it was it was very quick, and it was it was very frustrating. I'll be honest with you. It was I got frustrated. I got killed a lot. It's real easy to careen into the ground. You know, oh sure, yeah. I did that a lot. There are these big mountains occasionally, and you just but here's the <laughs> thing: you hit those real in easily. this game when you die. It's not like so many other Amiga games where there's the slow fade out, then the slow fade in of you sitting there in the thing in the cockpit, you know, with bloody, and then a game over screen appears, and then five minutes later you're back in. You die often in this game, but yeah. it gets you right back in the action. And you get a uh, you get a good a good chunk of, of opportunity. Yeah. And if it's funny when they always like save by a silkworm. Oh yeah, and I mean the animation of your guy with the with the parachute, you know, jumping out and stuff. Yeah. I mean it, it makes it makes your death entertaining. Well, I was entertained at first, and then it got very frustrating. I was less entertained. So I guess uh, in terms of the combat version of this game, it looks good. The options are there. There's a lot of fun stuff to do. The mission options are varied. Just the ones I saw were quite varied. Mm -hmm. But overall. I just didn't have that much fun. I found the whole thing very difficult, uh, and 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 difficult to fly and difficult to survive. Those other jets come in fast, and like there's a couple like I can't remember what level it is, but they're, in, they're on you instantly. They're instantly on top of you almost the second you launch. It's very frustrating. Uh, there were some missions that I enjoyed, but most of the, what I liked the most were in the other thing that this game brings to the table, which is this the Aero Olympics. Uh, style uh, ten event. Uh, I don't know what you would call this. Did, did you? Did you go? I through didn't that? mess with that at okay, all. Okay, I did. I went through it, and this is a, almost like a separate game mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a. These are events. Uh, there are ten events. You can have up to eight people play this, and like sort of like I guess you play like in track and field or something. You know, like a round robin uh, or hot seat, and in these you are taking a, a picking from a select group of aircraft to perform a task that they've given you for that level. The first level, for example, is to fly simply fly, fly your plane between two balloons. That's it, and come back. Uh, there, are th these range from that sort of simplicity. One of the levels in this is to rescue a spy that had been dropped from a plane. And so you're hauling tail across the board trying to get to this guy, and you can see him falling out of right. the sky. It's almost like a uh, like in Defender again, you yeah. know, when your guys are falling, you shoot the alien and the guy's falling down, and you got to pick him up. So th that's that's pretty crazy. There's another part in this that where they borrowed, and this is nigh impossible. I want to meet the man that can pull this trick. There's a there's a uh, if you ever played the old Atari twenty six hundred game Barnstorming, mm -hmm. there's a section of this where you have to climb over that first big mountain and go through a barn, <laughs> or basically it looks like a small hangar. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you kidding me? And the, with the controls in this thing, there's a it was a zero percent chance. Um, 
this game has weather conditions, uh, you know, fog and whatnot, uh, which then uh, the graphics in this are fine. They're perfectly fine. They look good. Uh, the opening in this is really cool. It's got a quarter, It's got a neat opening where these jets are flying over this like city in, this, in the clouds. It's pretty neat. Uh, I believe the CD32 version, which I of course skipped, has uh, like a, some kind of full motion gimmick in there. Uh, so I, I do like the Olympic stuff more. I thought it was a lot of fun, but it was again it, it, it's the same basic game, difficult. Uh, so I'm not here to condemn the game. Uh, uh, I'm just saying it would take uh, more time than I would probably lend to a game like this to master the controls. Is I that, think that's fair. You know, I mean, uh, the uh, it it's it, the setting up your controls is key. Uh, I will say that, and I'm and I agree with what you said. I was not comfortable with the control setup. See, I, I was able to do every. You know, I didn't mess. I used the default controls. Yeah. The only thing I had to use the keyboard for was putting up the landing gear and putting it down. Right. And I was fine. Like I said, this game came out in '94. Okay. So first of all, kudos to people that were still putting out Amiga games in '94. Yeah. Um, this was a game that if you would have been able to play with the CD32 pad with its full capacity, just being able to imagine if you could control your height with the with the trigger with the shoulder buttons. Well, I used you know? it. I used that pad, uh, and and and, and some of the button and it, they didn't. But I mean, I don't think you realize the amount of controls you probably even use that are available. There's like a ton of controls. Well, like, like, the, like the weapon thr- locking. There's dual. You got two weapons. Yeah, right. And maybe that was. Between, yeah. And did I, you ever switch between the weapons? Well, stuff like the, how you switch between the weapons is you hold left on your stick and you press the fire button and that's your alternate. Not your the alternate way I did button. it. <laughs> I was using the keyboard. So it was different. Your method may be better. I went, I tried two or three different methods to try to get the best one for me. But my thing is, if you're going to have a game like this, uh, I would rather just have uh, just have nor- some sort of normality with the controller. I don't need all the flight simulator stuff. Just give the plane a set speed or maybe a high and low speed, like a pole position. It's funny, I was reading uh, the interview with these guys, and they mentioned that, one of the guys mentioned that they, they loved Time Pilot, which is a great game, mm-hmm. but they hated the controls. See, I'm the exact opposite. I like the controls of Time Pilot. I think they're simple. Keep it simple. This is not, I mean, if you're going to make a flight simulator, do it. But don't make, I mean, even Choplifter was not complicated. It's arguably the same sort of control, uh, you know, vehicle you're controlling. I think they put a little bit too much in there for me. That's just yeah. me. You know, I think that these guys wanted to do something truly unique. They wanted to give you a flight simulator <laughs> with an incredible amount of planes, you know, but make and make it mission based with a varied amount of missions. I mean, on paper, if you looked at all the things that this game offers you, you'd say, "Wow, that's a really complete package." Now, is it executed perfectly? No, but you know, I had fun with it, and you know, to me, this is more fun than a game like Time Pilot just because of the, the variety of things to do. Not me. I'll take Time Pilot any day of the week over this. It's I like it. Like I said, if we're going to have an arcade game, let's have one. I don't like I don't like this hybrid. Well, we're not having an I arcade mean, even, game. I mean, even even Wings, I mean, which is arguably this uh, in terms of a flight simulator arcade uh, thing is simple. It's simple. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's, I like it's dead it. simple. You know, I, that's good about. That's what I like about yeah, it. So, this is just a little you know, if you want complexity, this is not the game for you. I guess that's the long no, and short of it. If you don't, if you want complexity, this is the game yeah, for you. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, I looked at some reviews for this, and clearly, I'm in a minority because the reviews for this are quite good. Boaster, um, this uh, for starters, this was ranked uh, the twentieth, the twenty eighth best game of all time by Mega Power. In uh, 1996, that's pretty good. That's a, and that's a lot of games. Uh, Lemon, the, the Lemon guys give the ECS version of this an 8.08, and they give the CD32 AGA version 8.56. Also, very good scores. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're looking over the scores here, the ECS version g- generally re- receives scores between uh, the middle 70s up into almost up to 90, and the AGA version of this got scores. In the upper 70s, all the way to 91. So they were both in that C plus B minus uh, range. Which I mean, I'm listen. I'm not going to kill the game. It, it, it's got a lot going for it. I just wish I was better at it. And this and that frustrates me in some ways. Because I, I, there's a, I think locked in here. If I can figure out the key, is a, is an interesting game, especially with the amount of work and and, and what going in it. Uh, eBay wise. Uh, Before you get to eBay, oh. let's let's do our, our Discord oh, reviews yeah, just to ahead. continue our review theme. Um, so the, the, it was sort of a, a wide swath really? this week. Yeah, I um, was wondering what they were going to say. Yeah, Chris Fold says, uh, 
Is it a shooter or is it a flight sim? It's neither, and neither is worth playing. <laughs> Here you go. A detail freak's dream of planes mission types does not counteract the three main issues. The controls are horrible, combat is dull and sparse, and the most important factor in any game is missing. It's just not fun. Three out of ten. So Fold's wow. not a fan. Not a fan he of this one. He hated it more than I did. Graham Vebke says, A wacky flight simulator where you have a vast selection of planes and perform various missions. I wouldn't call this game a true shooter. You do shoot, but it's very sparse, and the controls are its biggest hurdle. Six out of ten. Pixels at Dawn says, Actually closer to a side-on flight sim, but gets extra points for not having to be a qualified pilot to actually land the plane. Um, lots of planes and some really interesting missions, although for preference, I would ditch the combat altogether. Seven out of ten. I think that that's fair. I could do without the combat. In this Ditching game. the combat? What? Why would you do that? Have it's a game where you're, you're a combat fighter. Have you ever played Pilot Wings? Yeah. There's a lot of fun to be had flying a plane around without blowing but stuff up. But you're not up. fighting. These are these are fighter jets. <laughs> if you don't have the combat, I don't get. I don't see the appeal. Okay. Pilot Wings is a fantasy game. This is reality, man. Okay. Okay. Uh, Matthew Perron says played a couple of games and the game is really interesting with a great variety of planes to choose from. I crashed into the runway and the game congratulated me for it. Yes, that, <laughs> Six out of ten, but I want to know more. So thank you. you. <laughs> thank you to all of our uh, Patreon supporters on our Discord channel for uh, submitting those reviews. It's really good. Aaron, did you look up this game on eBay? I did. I did. Um, the uh, There were a few titles. The one A CD32 version recently had sold for 33 bucks, and there was a $39 version that was the box ECS version. Now this is also in a couple collections. The, the Grand Slam 32X collection, 29 bucks for the CD for that. The Grand Slam 32X collection? Yeah, the 30 that's what it was called. Man. Wow. Yeah. I wonder It was for the it was for the thir, the CD32. Right, but yeah. 32X? I I don't know why. You got me. That's what yeah. that's the way it was listed on eBay. Cross promotion with no, the No, I don't think I don't think there's a cross promotion. <laughs> Are you nuts? Are you kidding me? Um Aaron, we did get some feedback uh, last week. We have a new Patreon supporter. This is our boy. Awesome. Our buddy, 10-Minute Amiga Retrocast. Oh, yes. We know him well. He says, hey, guys. To be honest, it was Boat's sultry voice that did it. I just can't wait to hear him try and fit 10-Minute Amiga Retrocast into the song. Yeah. <laughs> that is a hurdle. He says, I do appreciate what you guys do, and I know it's not cheap. When I got back into the Amiga back in June, I caught that darn bug to start ordering some new toys for it. X-Surf 100 Nick Card, M Mark II Flicker Fixer Rapid Road USB, and of course a new few new Amigas here and there off eBay. What really killed me is when I decided to get another VIC-20, which turned into two VIC-20s, and then a C64, and then a Plus 4, and then two C128s, and three disk drives, then an SS64. I just need to stop. <laughs> I love it. You I know sound you like it, a man after our own heart, 10-Minute Amiga Retrocast. No doubt. Thank you. You know, uh, we should mention that uh, when we got a, uh, a lovely gift uh, last week of a uh, Amiga 600 motherboard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that came in. Was it Arizona? That was, that was, yeah, Adam from uh, New Mexico. I New think. Mexico, yeah. my bad. Uh, you know me, I can't help myself. And despite the fact that I told myself I wouldn't fool with it right away, I went home that night and fooled with it right away. And, of course, it was a dirty mess. And I so I did. Uh, I went in and just washed that sucker down old school, the way you do it. And FYI, for the record, I've watched a lot of videos on people going back and forth about how to clean a PCB. Let me tell you something. I worked in a place that made PCBs. Every single one of them goes through a washer. All right, so anyone that worries that they're gonna get get it wet, now there are components you don't wanna get wet, for example, batteries, speakers, that sort of thing. Every one of these things goes through a washer. They have to because they go through a, a solder, a wave solder machine that solders all the components on and it leaves wads and wads of flux all over the machines. They have to go through a, a, a solder, so a, a washer. So if anyone's out there wondering, you can wash them. But anyway, once I cleaned it up, I plugged it in and uh, reseated some chips and it fired right up. Worked like a champ. Now I've had some trouble getting any memory expansions to work on the uh, on the belly slot, but it's a, it looks like a working board. Uh, and I've actually played a couple games in it and it, it works. So we thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. I will continue my efforts uh, on that. But yes, it can get expensive, too, because I've already been jonesing for uh, some sort of super-duper Amiga 600 gimmick to stick on it. <laughs> so I'm trying to talk myself out of it. 
And uh, finally, uh, it's been a while since I've asked for your iTunes reviews. So if you enjoy the show and have not yet reviewed us on iTunes, even if you don't listen on iTunes, uh, please write us a quick review. Um, you know, iTunes reviews go into a lot of aggregates, even for other podcatchers, to determine what things pop up on search results, etc. And uh, your reviews really help us a lot. Aaron, last week, the Patreon Song Challenge. Um, you know, we... Uh, I, I thought that Pixels was the only uh, the only winner. I was wrong. I oh, went back and checked after he after I he heard said about it. this, yes. Matthew Perron. Matthew yeah. Perron. I'm a crappy weird owl song that's not a parody. Oh yeah, my god. Yeah. Matthew little, Perron. Little bonus. Yeah, that's a little bonus. Nobody puts Matthew Perron in the corner boat. That's, you, that's what you did, so you're making up for it with that little ditty, I guess. Um, so Last week's song, I guess that was two weeks ago. Last week's song, House of the Rising Sun. Yeah, we all got that yeah. one. It was a, uh, we had uh, Gary Hucker with a late entry. Congratulations. Pixels at Dawn, Paul Harrington, Trey Guard, Pac Billy, Tech Cowboy. Ooh. Tech Cowboy and Pac Billy. That sounds like a great show. That sounds like a show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, a, like it's a sitcom. Right. Uh, Matthew Perron again, Terry Howard, Chris Folds, Jonas Rulo, Andrew Monks, Andy Craig, and Nilly, a longtime listener from Sweden. Ooh, yeah. I'm, I can only assume that he is the Swedish version of Nelly. How's that spelled? N I L L Y. I like it. Yeah. So, Aaron, this week, if you find it within your heart to guess okay. this week's Patreon song, you can all, you never you never submit. I knew last week. I knew. You, Trust me, every time you sing, I submit. <laughs> I'm submitting right now. Please God no. Um, you can send me an email at John at amigospodcast.com. Um, simply with this with the subject line stop. Would be <laughs> um, so here we go. And this is with our new edition. Ten minute amiga retro cat. Counting virtual sheep, Bernard Quinn, retro man cave. Tim Drew, Daniel, William, Simon, Rose, Joseph Harrison, Kyle, Edda, Rob O'Hara. Howard Nibs, Matthew, Lara Moore, Andy Crick, Sean Zoe, Darren Lomax, Colin 419, Bach Bid, Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie, John Cook, Dan Ross, Leaf Killon, Alan Kebab, Check out the level, Lord John, Marshall, Matthew, Perron, Ricky DeRosha, Creepy Dead Boy, Figgy CTZ, The Slow Norris, Steph, Ford, Sorgon, and Mortensen, and then Helen, Blindo 75. Christopher Hussell, Ravi Abbott, Chris Foles, Dreamcatcher, Lauren Giroux, Graham Vebke, Brent Dowdy, Lane Denson, Adam Batters, Bill Bryan's Retro Vintage, Gary Hawkins, C. Brian Jones, Paul Harrington. Duncan Styles, Alan Kelbaum, Anthony Jarvis. Tapes from the Crypt, Josh Nett, and Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THE, Eric Nelson, Kim Tommy, Humbert Stad, Daniel Bingston, Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Warns, Pixels of Dawn, and Kjolbjorn Barman. I had no idea what that was. I have no, I have no idea. Well, I wrote that one. That so was I emotional. Don't really think about it. I mean, that, that was a roller coaster ride. It was. It was. Well, Aaron, it's cold and lonely <laughs> in the deep dark night here at Amigo Studios. <laughs> but next week, <laughs> we're going to be back with the adventures of Robin Hood. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah, man. Take a trip to Nottingham, home mm -hmm. of Rabbi Abbott. Oh, yeah? Okay. And we're going to play some Adventures of Robin Hood. I wonder if Robbie steals from the rich and gives the poor. Every day. Really? Every day, buddy. That's mm -hmm. all he does. All right, guys. Until then, keep on playing the Amiga. We'll see you next week. Adios. Adios.